uh, get started with the last talk today uh, by Richard uh, Peng. It will talk about scalable algorithmic primitives for data science. Uh, is the mic working? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Great. OK, uh, thanks for the introduction, David. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, scalable algorithmic primitives for data science. Uh, just a bit of a heads up that uh, this is uh, a set of new, new slides, and uh, it, it does cover quite a bit of material. These are not things I'm familiar with. In fact, what I learned over the last two days is that there's a lot of things I don't know about things in, in this talk. So if you have any questions, if you're here to stop me, actually, please stop me. Uh, the later part of this talk there is actually fairly time flexible. So if you have any questions, stop me and ask, and I'll be happy to go into more details. So let me start off with a motivation. Uh, the motivating idea is that uh, is the, the, the topic I want to address in this talk, quite a few of them are motivated by several of these problems that's, bec that's uh, quite that become quite prevalent in data science. So these are things in network science where you want to measure the importance of edges in a graph. You want to partition or cluster a network. You, in image video processing, we saw a talk yesterday about taking the pixel image and doing a low rank factorization. This is, in general, this is things like denoising, segmenting an image. This is one of the key problems studied there. In scientific computing, there is a lot of these kind of fairly large meshes that you want to do, you want to model physical forces, you want to model fluid simulation, you want to model uh, the behavior of waves on them. Each, of the, each one of these is a fairly rich area on its own. So things like centrality, there is, I mean, basically each one of these, there could be a separate talk on them. But what I want to kind of focus on is I want to focus on some commonalities in the ways that people have devised to address these problems. Which is that when we address these problems, there tend to be quite a few of these primitives that we like to invoke. So this includes things like the backslash command, which solves a system of linear equations. This includes things like solving a convex optimization problem, which on networks gives you things like shortest path or flows, or this is one of the things that use, gets used a lot in graph decompositions. There's a, also eigenvector SVD, which so several of the earlier talks I've also got across, which is the idea that I want to compute eigenvectors. So, there, so the, the, short, the short takeaway is that there are several of these commands that we, we like to invoke a lot when dealing with these large-scale data. And I want to just start with one of them. So I'll start with the one that I consider to be kind of the more fundamental one, which is the solving a system of linear equations. And I will just appeal to reductions, even though this is not how you want to solve optimization problem. But I would like to claim that if you can solve a system of linear equations, you can solve an optimization problem. And if you can solve a system of linear equations by things like inverse power method, you can get significantly faster eigensolvers as well. And so this raises the question of linear system as an algorithmic primitive. And one of we, one, of the thing, one of the recent developments is that the data sets has been getting larger and larger. So this actually has been putting a lot of pressure on getting on, on the performance of one of these linear system solver primitives. So especially the backslash command in, say, MATLAB. And I think in Julia is just the, the solve command. And I would like to compare this against one of the probably the most successful algorithmic primitive, which is quicksort. So in comparison, I would like to claim that there is actually quite a bit of discrepancy between our linear system solver and things that we really think of as an algorithmic primitive, which is quicksort. Excuse me? Yes. When you say a linear system solver, do you mean a direct method or an iterative method? Oh, I'm being purposely ambiguous. I will, I will get to both direct and iterative methods in a bit. So I'm just, yeah, actually, yeah, here I'm using backslash. What I really should be saying is this is our generic solve. And the and I, I just want to compare against quicksort. And these are the kind of the, uh, the key traits that I would like to mention, which is that, first of all, quicksort is a linear space algorithm. Quicksort is parallelizable. Actually, quicksort is one of the benchmarks people use to test the data center. So some of you may have heard the story of the petasort, which is basically, I have this many machines connected. I just use a quicksort to just check whether I have wired them up the correct way. Quicksort. Uh, it's also fairly easy to implement. A reasonably efficient version of quicksort is about 30 lines of code. And empirically, the behavior of quicksort is something like 20 passes over the data. I'm using 20 n in a very liberal sense. Theoretically, it's an n log n time algorithm. But the practical behavior wall clock wise is roughly 20 passes over your data. 
I, and I claim that when you compare linear system versus quicksort in, the, in these parameters, in every one of them, linear system solver as a primitive is lacking. You can get linear system solver to be uh, to, to, to work in linear space, but sometimes you, but there you also lose a bit in time. But the majority of the linear system commands, solving commands we have, things like backslash, this is something that takes super linear space. But that's, that's a direct solver, right? I mean, depending on if you have iterative methods, they have different convergence properties depending on the norms and all. So I guess you're talking about a direct method then. I'm talking about things that we can just invoke in, say, one line of command, right? So quicksort, I mean, there are also the variants as well. But right now, if you go to MATLAB, you invoke backslash on something with about 10 to the 8 non zeros. That will basically, the first thing that will chuck to a halt is that your computer will run out of memory. So I'm really talking about this in a sense of what can you invoke and what can we just take, say, download snap, and what can we run them on? With some work, you can make space linear, but then here there's also the issue of parallelizable. There's actually a trade-off, right? If you go to iterative methods, iterative methods are not as parallel as a direct method. In lines of code, right, when you invoke lap LAPEC, if you invoke backslash, the number of lines of C++ that gets invoked is something like 10 to the 4 lines of code. And also, if you look at runtime, the runtime Question mark, because for some instances, they run really well. For some instances, there is a significant slowdown. In fact, I will talk about the, uh, and this runtime, the way to describe it is that we, we can actually solve some linear systems really well. So this is a very, this plot to me was fairly interesting. What we did is we took one of these methods. So this is a convex optimization algorithm. This is an interior point method. We invoked. Linear system solvers. These are basically things like Jacobi iteration, gauss seidel incomplete LU factorization, MST preconditioner, algebraic multigrid. So these are some fairly standard benchmarks. They were invoked from the Trilinos package from Sandia. And what we did is we ran them on an interior point method. And then we plotted the time. Okay, so this so is the- Do you use these as preconditioners, Jacobi? Oh uh, yeah, we, we use them inside a PCG. We use these inside precondition conjugate gradient inside an interior point algorithm. So what we did is we took a second order method and then we, at every iteration, we solved the linear system and then we measured how long the linear system solve took. And what's interesting here is that on the first iteration, they all ran really well. Oh, by the way, we also took a really hard instance, which is a 50 by 50 by 50 cube grid. Those of you are familiar with graph algorithms or familiar with, say, like a Dimax data set, the 50 by 50 by 50 cube, this is one of the hardest instances for graph algorithms. So, so the interesting thing is that on the first iteration, they all run really well. But then as the interior point method kind of chugs along and it starts transferring these, it starts generating these numerically more and more difficult problems, these methods, their behavior tends to start going all over the board until about iteration 25 to 30, where their behavior is significantly slower than on the first iteration. Well, that's because the matrix is becoming singular, and the convergence rate depends on the condition number of the matrix, right? As the interior method, I guess, Michael, you can correct me, gets to the, to the bound or whatever, to the boundary of the active set, the matrix becomes more ill-conditioned. If you had used the backslash, which is just a direct method, you wouldn't have seen any difference. So the, the issue with the backslash is that it's a direct method. And on this kind of instance, this is already starting to approach the limit. Yes, because the matrices, matrices are becoming more ill-conditioned that you see that in, in that interior point method. And the, the readme from the, the outer loop, which is actually says exactly the same thing, which is that because of the behavior of all these fast linear system solvers, sometimes when you, depends on the problem you're running on, Sometimes you actually have to invoke a different solver, or sometimes you might even have to run your code again. I mean, for this, uh, the, uh, one of the authors of this package, this was for the isotonic regression problem. And uh, one of the authors, Rasmus, is actually in the audience. So I'll, I, I've heard some, I mean, I'm not totally familiar with the story, but this is what the README file says. What, what are this JS and MST? Uh, SGS is a sparse gauss Seidel. So gauss seidel is I take the matrix and I take the upper diagonal and I precondition with that. Okay. And the MST is because the, the problem here, it's a, it has graph theoretic structure. So what you can do is you can take the matrix and you can take a max weight spanning tree and you precondition by that. So this is kind of one of these graph theoretic methods that I, I'll get to that in a bit as well. But in general, the, 
but what what the, this also means is that actually there has been, if you look at the first column though, this is very reassuring in that it says that we do know how to solve a lot of linear systems really well. In fact, there has been extensive work on linear system solving. And uh, one indication of this is that uh, uh, when the Society of Industrial and Applied Mathematics had their editors name the top 10 algorithms of the 20th century, three out of 10 algorithms are directly related to solving systems of linear equations. So these are things like matrix decomposition. So this is kind of like blocking of matrices. QR factorization, which there have been several talks on. Krylov space methods, which is another one of these iterative methods used to compute eigenvectors. In fact, for most natural linear systems, and I completely agree with, uh, uh, agree with you that the example I was showing is a very adversarial example in that it's artificially transferring the difficulty of a combinatorial, a problem from combinatorial optimization into the linear system itself. But for most naturally occurring linear systems, we actually have very good solvers. For, in both MATLAB and Julia, when for most systems of say 10 to the six non zeros, we can solve that in a couple of seconds. Your, your solve command does do that in a couple of seconds. But then this leads to the open question, which is that can we do this provably? for all systems of linear equations. And, the, and this is becoming increasingly important just because how many situations do we have now of the, where we do need to invoke linear system solvers. I'm sorry again in that in, in your example though you had conjugate gradient, right, which took advantage of the of the structure of the matrix because it's a symmetric positive definite matrix, while the backslash command does either pivoted IU or else it does a QR. Or maybe it doesn't have CVD, or depending on what you have. But I mean, I guess we need to, to distinguish whether the, the algorithms exploit the structure of the matrix. Right? Yeah, there, there is a lot of layers to how, how the complexity of one of these work. And I will get to the distinction between direct and iterative in a second as well. And what I want to talk about in this talk is I want to talk about some recent progress in trying to address this question and the, the central role that randomized numerical linear algebra plays in getting all of these pieces to talk to each other. And to do that, I need to, to go through exactly what you were mentioning, which is I need to talk about what are the current pieces we have for solving systems of linear equations. And for this talk, I will focus on the linear case, but almost everything I say actually have nonlinear extensions. And I will mention that very briefly in the slide where I introduce these, these concentration bounds. So, there, so as, you're, as, as uh, you have been saying, there are two main types of ideas for solving systems of linear equations. One of them, direct method, this, has been, this is probably one of the oldest studied algorithms in that the first descriptions of direct, uh, of direct methods probably are old. Uh, they were written before, they were not even written Arabic numbers. So this, is, this example is written in what's called rod calculus, which is kind of an earlier system for denoting numbers. And this operation is essentially, I mean, they also pivoted the rows in a very weird way. They were taking the last column and they were using this to cancel this column. So the operation here is that they use this column to eliminate this non-zero. But the idea of direct methods is that they try to modify my matrix entry by entry until my matrix gets to a point where it becomes easy to solve. This has led to a lot of beautiful work in areas like combinatorial scientific computing where one tries to systematically model the non-zero structure. So this is basically the backslash command. This leads theoretic, more theoretically, this kind of idea is present in matrix multiplication. It's present in parallel graph algorithms. It's also present in things like sparsified squaring, which some of you may know from log space connectivity. The other type of key building block is iterative methods. The idea of iterative method is instead of trying to modify my matrix so that good things happen, I just try to numerically converge to a solution. I'm sorry, why did you say the direct methods are combinatorial? Uh, direct methods, I mean, I'm, because they try to physically, they, they, they don't really look at the numerical structure of your matrix. Sure, they do. Uh, this, this is probably sparse Cholesky. Where, where yeah, the, when you start combining direct and iterative, like you run incomplete Cholesky inside PCG, that's the point. But I consider that to be a hybrid method, in that you're doing something to the direct, you're doing something to the matrix in a way that you're also looking at the numerical structure as well. 
But direct methods, for example, Gauss elimination, right? Gauss elimination, it says that under exact arithmetic, all I care about is the combinatorial structure. When you have a fast direct method solver, things like nested dissection, the nested dissection, there are results that say that as long as my non-zero structure is planar, there's actually not as much dependence on the numerical structure compared to, say, iterative methods. Where iterative methods, your dependence on the eigenvalue and eigenstructure so you're is. Looking, you're talking about sparse direct methods where one reorders the matrix in order to avoid filling. But if the matrix is dense, one wouldn't do the reordering. Yeah, no, a lot, of the, a lot of these things are really kind of building upon this kind of idea for getting good orderings, combinatorial scientific computing type ideas. For the dense case, you're really looking at things like matrix multiplication and so on. For the idea of iterative method, on the other hand, is I try to gradually converge to a solution. So it's the kind of idea is that I take, I want to solve AX equal to B by just repeatedly doing, this is called Richardson iteration. There, there's also a constant here that I'm missing. But the simplest iterative method is literally at every time I add the residual of my iterand onto my vector. It's not in media that this converges. But one thing you can notice is that the fixed point of this is basically if AX equal to B. So if, once I do have convergence, right, I do arrive at a solution. And the speed of convergence of an iterative method can be controlled by instead solve, by introducing what's called a preconditioner. So this B inverse. And instead of solving AX equal to B, I solve B inverse AX equal to B inverse B. At which point your iterand becomes every time I take the residual and I multiply by B inverse. And this gives you a lot more control. It gives you room to start manipulating between the difficulty of, a pre of solving the preconditioner and the speed of convergence. So you get to two extremes. One is that if you have a simple B, I can just set B to be identity, in which case I'll just need as many iterations as unpreconditioned. Or that I can set B equal to A, in which case I'll finish in one iteration, but I need to solve the same problem. And the kind of the, the intricacy in iterative method is all about finding the right B. And this is kind of one of the key ideas underlying, say, conjugate gradient algorithms. Convex optimization, things like gradient descent, preconditioned gradient descent, can also be viewed as another case of iterative methods. And Krylov space method is also another variant of iterative methods. My conjugate gradient is a Krylov space method, right? Oh, yeah, yes. And the interesting thing about both of these methods is that they both have instances that they do extremely well on. And they also both have instances where they're problematic. And the, the, way, to, the way I think about the, the, the scalability of these algorithms is really using this notion that the, the way that com that's high performance computing does it, which is that they think of the non zeros graph theoretically. There is this very nice correlation between graphs and matrices, where the non-zeros in your graph, you can, think about, you can think about every variable as a vertex, and then every non-zero, because it's in some row and column, you can think about it as an edge between a pair of vertices. And this kind of view of your combinatorial structure as a graph, it lets you think about the difficulty of your problem. <laughs> and the, here, there are two extreme cases. One is I have a very highly connected problem. And the other extreme, I have a long path. And the interesting thing is that for a highly connected instance, what I want is I want to use iterative methods. I want to take very global steps because my entire problem is just a single thing. It's very well connected. Everything I do is symmetric. I might as well take global steps. And if you start to apply iterative methods, what happens is that your fill just goes to, just, just, just becomes extreme. For path, on the other hand, what you really want to do to a path is a direct method. Because if you start eliminating from one end of the path, so these things are like tri-diagonal matrices. If you eliminate from one end of a path, very good things happen. You have zero fill. But on the other hand, if you try to propagate information iteratively on a path, right, what happens is that every step, you can only talk to your neighbor, which means that the number of iterations you need is lower bounded by the diameter of your graph. You need, you need one end of the graph must talk to the other. So we get these two extreme instances where direct method is good, good on one, iterative method is good on the other. And vice versa, direct method is bad on this one, iterative method is good on the other, is bad on this one. And the biggest problem with matrices and graphs is that they're additive. I can take any two matrices, I can put them together, I get an even more extreme instance. So the difficulty in getting provably nearly linear time algorithm for this, you can essentially think about it as I want to avoid paying order and iterations given by the diameter of the graph. 
times the cost of m per iteration, which is what you need to do a single propagation step if you take a global step. So this leads to ideas where I want to get what's called hybrid algorithms, which is I want to start putting together direct and iterative methods in a way where I can provably leverage the, what's strong about each one without running into the bad case for the other. And one of the earliest example of this is basically preconditioned uh, sparse Cholesky factorization, which is what you have been mentioning. It's the idea that I can, instead of calling Cholesky, which is the backslash command, I can call PCG with incomplete Cholesky inside. And in terms of linear system solving, probably the easiest takeaway is that in, sometimes instead of using the backslash, I can call this command with in MATLAB called PCG and then I troll inside. And that tends to work for matrices that's about a factor 10, 20 bigger. And, but of course, the issue with the reason MATLAB doesn't use that as its default solve command is that because this depends on numerical structure, it leads to some fairly iffy situations sometimes. So the backslash is the more dependable command. And the next step in this kind of hybrid algorithm was taken by Vijay. And what Vijay was, what really motivated Vijay to do this was he was really studying interior point methods, but applied to the minimum cost flow problem. So he was looking at the Hessian matrix of the interior point method, applied to a min cost flow and multi-commodity flow problems. And he started saying that because my problem is related to a graph, what I want to do is I want to precondition my graph with a graph as well. And I want to analyze the approximation ratio between these using graph direct techniques. So what he really advocated was this very tight coupling between the combinatorial and numerical algorithms. And leads to some fairly absurd statements, like what the relative condition number between a pair of graphs, or what is the diameter of a matrix, or what is the average clustering coefficient, or the, the centrality of a matrix. And what this leads to is it leads to the, I mean, what this res, re, eventually resulted in is it resulted in statements that look absurd to both graph algorithmists as well as numerical analysts. But from an algorithmic perspective, what this seems to be doing is that there are actually several ways to make sense of this. One is that you're viewing the numerical operator as another resource of error, and you're just controlling this kind of operator error as another algorithmic resource, the same way that you will control, say, the size of your problem or, say, the amortized potential of your data structures. So it's just another form of convergence error or another parameter in designing an algorithm. And the other idea that this really led to is this very fine-grained coupling between combinatorial and numerical tools in these algorithms. And the and to do this, we really need to start specifying what is the numerical structure of my matrices. And here, the starting point, which is, and this is one of the simplest cases where my matrix has both graph theoretic and good numerical structure, is what's called a graph Laplacian matrix. These are related to M matrices. And the idea is that I can take a graph, I can write down a matrix where it's an adjacency matrix, but then I take the diagonal with the degrees and I subtract away the adjacency matrix. These are the objects that are central to spectral algorithms, which is why a lot of the earlier results in this area actually took, went through spectral graph theory. It comes up naturally in inference on graphs, and the application that, motiva that, motiva that motivated Vyger to think about them is that it's related to the Hessian of interior point algorithms. So, and this led to a lot of work. And the work that really caused this area to take off is this result by Spielman and Tent who stated that any graph Laplacian can be provably solved in nearly linear time. What does nearly linear mean? It also means that something comically bad. It means about m times log, log into the power of 70. But then once the, kind of the, the cool thing about theory is that once you, have a, once you have an indication that might be an algorithm in some space, then we can keep on working on it. We can keep on whittling away at the parameters. So the, the, this led to essentially a, a halving of this parameter every two years. And then it led to, went to log n, log squared n, and then went to log n. And when this log n came out, we started asking, is this just another case of Zeno's paradox, which is that I, if I kind of run towards the end goal, which is get linear time algorithms, do I just always just half my distance to it? And unfortunately, this became a self-fulfilling prophecy in that we actually came up with a m square root log n time algorithm. <laughs> 
But the other thing that's really exciting about this is also people figure out how to, how to take these ideas to the nonlinear setting. In a nonlinear setting, you can write down this kind of optimization problem involving the edge vertex incidence matrix of a graph, which is what I'll get to. And here, you, people started improving over fundamental results in combinatorial optimization, things like max flow, min cost flow, bipartite matching, matrix rescaling. Basically, these are all improve, have been, all been improved over the last 10 years. The short, and the other thing is that now there ha actually have been several code packages. The most, the most comprehensive this is actually being maintained uh, in Julia. It's called Laplacian.jl. And this has things like effective resistance, spectral clustering, eigenvalues. It has a whole bunch of nice things, and I, if, and I highly urge you to check it out. But what I want to talk about is the kind of the core ideas that have really developed in this, in this, in this kind of area which seeks to integrate combinatorial and numerical algorithms. And here there really have been two kinds of ideas. One is this really this kind of original picture by Vaija, which is I gradually take my graph and I convert it to things that's more tree-like. And then there's a more recent one where we tr instead of turning a graph into a tree, we try to turn a graph into a clique. So we try to just take Gaussian elimination, and we try to speed up some kind of elimination-based algorithm. And the way that to summarize what these are doing is that there is really two types of methods called ultrasparsifier and elimination, where the goal of ultrasparsification is really motiva motivated by graph algorithms, which are really based on trees. So what it seeks to do is it seeks to gradually remove edges and then make my object more tree-like. And on the other hand, the elimination-based algorithms is really motivated by Gaussian elimination. And what it seeks to do is it seeks to get rid of a lot of edges. So it seeks to do Gaussian elimination, but in a way that it has access to the numerical structure and uses the numerical structure to provably keep everything intermediate sparse, as well as having small error against the original object. So the idea there is that I want to work on the condition number of the matrix. And I incur a small error, but I try to make a factor two reduction com condition number every time. Uh, but not in Gauss elimination. That doesn't apply to Gauss elimination. So this has been recently, there is a work by uh, Rasmus and Sushant. Uh, the big thing in Gauss elimination is growth, pivot growth. That uh, the L and the U factors have a condition number that's larger than that of the original matrix. That's, a, that's why one pivots in Gauss elimination. So I'm talking about algorithms that's focused on graph Laplacians. And graph Laplacian, because they're symmetric matrices, what you can do is that because it's symmetric, every time you get rid of a row, you get rid of the corresponding column as well. well. It's symmetric positive definite, right? And yeah, this is really for uh, graph Laplacians. These, both of these algorithms are really geared towards graph Laplacians. I see. So you're only talking about graph Laplacians, nothing else. OK. Yeah, I will get to the more general case in a later slide as well. So the, but the core idea in these algorithms is that I want to do this very gradual transfer. So notice that I'm taking very fine-grained trade-offs between my problem difficulty and my approximation factors. I'm trading a factor k reduction in edges for an error that is k times log squared n. I'm trading a factor 2 improvement in condition number for a 1 over log n error. So you get a lot of these very fine control of error versus problem size. And the key idea that really enabled this is really this kind of high dimensional concentration phenomenon. So the key phenomenon here is really dimensionality reduction. And here, the, the, I mean, there, has, there have been several very interesting talks on this phenomenon about sampling from large matrices. And, I'll, and the way that I really like to think about this phenomenon is really through this result called Banach space embeddings, which states that there's a, this is a result from, this is a way of, the func this is a way functional analysis thinks about the world. In that for any function f, I can take a matrix A, and I think about a Banach space that is f of Ax. And the kind of the fundamental result in Banach spaces is that for any n-dimensional Banach space has an embedding into a space that is roughly size uh, dimension times log n over epsilon squared. And here the result is really phrased in terms of norms. And for those of you from, uh, basically for norms, is you just take every entry of your vector, you take to some power, and you take the 1 over p root of the whole thing. But algorithmically, what this kind of embedding result is really saying is that if I have a matrix with many more rows than columns, I can subsample a set of rows in a way that I algorithmically I preserve the operator structure. 
And the way that this can be used is that as long as I have this kind of space approximation, what you can show is that any optimization problem you're solving on the original matrix, it's okay to solve it on the sampled matrix. So you can actually just transfer your error directly. You can transfer your problem directly from a matrix with many rows to a matrix with few rows. And this kind of statement is crucial for this kind of trading between combinatorial and numerical difficulty. Because it's a statement that says that I can get rid of rows of my matrix in a way that I completely preserve the numerical structure. So one end of it is completely combinatorial, the other side is completely numerical. Yes? So F need not be linear, right? Some kind of Lipschitz condition or something like that is needed on F? I'm actually not sure how general F can be. So it, this definitely works for every norm. So it works for Euclidean distance, it works for one norm, it works for, say, four norm as well. There is some dependency on, some, on the function. I'm not familiar with what is the extent which this can be done. And to discuss how this works on graphs, I do need to introduce one more object, which is the edge vertex incidence matrix. Just like the graph Laplacian, this is another object that you can write another matrix that you can write down from a graph. In that what you do is you take one row for every edge and you put a minus one and a one in its two endpoints. And, uh, and the reason I like this matrix is that this really drives home the point of why I want an approximation in the BX two norm space. In that if you think about a vector that is plus one on some vertices, minus one some other vertices, or just one on some vertices, zero somewhere else, for a single edge, what that will give you is it gives you xu minus xv squared. So if you let x be a subset of vertices in a graph, then bx2 norm, what it gives you is exactly how many edges leave that subset of vertices. This gives you graph cuts. With a little bit more work, you can also show that if you approximate b, b transpose b, because l is the, is the gram matrix of b, what you actually can get is you can get this kind of approximation in Laplacian matrices as well. So, you can, so what this implies is that any undirected graph have a sparse approximation. And, and the point I would like to stress about this kind of statement, what's really important about this kind of statement, it says that I'm approximating an undirected graph by another undirected graph. So, so far we have talked a lot about applying randomized numerical tools to matrices. But we have not talked about structuring the output. And what's really crucial about this kind of method is that it's very important for the output of a matrix to also be structured. And the way that this gets used, I will illustrate this on the next slide, which is that the way you can incorporate it into an algorithm is you can take this reduction from matrix multiplication to linear system solving. There's this object called a sure complement, which is what happens if you take a matrix, you take a subset of variables, which I call f, and I eliminate them. And here there's a result by Strassen. So the sure complement is given by this formula here. And here there's a result by Strassen from, this is actually from the first fast matrix multiplication result that says that as long as I can solve on the original block and I can solve on the sure complement, I can solve on the whole thing. This is basically block elimination. But the interesting thing that happens here is that because my original matrix is a graph, you can actually prove that your sure complement is also a graph. So now you can actually go explicitly control the density of all your intermediate matrices. You can directly go and sparsify this object and only work with sparse matrices during every intermediate step of your algorithm. And this is how the, uh, the nearly, well, this is my favorite one slide explanation of how a nearly linear time Laplacian solver works. It's just that you use the fact that as you eliminate uncertain well-structured classes of matrices, the intermediate objects also stay well-structured. And the key idea there is then you have to think through how to efficiently get all these objects. Here you get a bit of a funny chicken and egg problem in that you don't even want to construct a dense one, but you want to still manipulate it. And here, basically everyone's favorite algorithmic tools can all be applied. You can do things like sketching, you can do things like spanners, data structures, matrix martingales, and my favorite, recursion. Due to interest of time, I'll skip how these algorithms work. But a lot of things do, do come into play here. Uh, you can also eliminate, take, things, take things to eliminate more things. You can get to uh, this kind of matrices that come up from scientific computing, these kind of linear elasticity problems. You can generalize. And one thing that come, that's <coughs> becomes very interesting here is that these problems actually turn out to be complete. In that you can actually show that 
for any positive semi-definite matrix, this is a result by uh, Rasmus King and uh, Peng Zhang. What they showed is that actually any PSD matrix can actually be written as the intermediate state, eliminated state of a two commodity flow matrix. So instead of having a single label at every vertex, or as in a graph, Laplace have two labels. This actually turns out to be complete for everything. So this actually gives you one of the approaches to actually address all general matrices as well. On the kind of the even more absurd side, the other thing kind of, you can kind of do from this is you can actually design graph sparsification for directed graphs. In that for directed graphs, actually, if you think in terms of operators, unless you think algorithmically, you actually come up with a lot of counterexamples. But one way to actually design this is you actually reverse engineer from the iterative methods of a way for directed graphs to approximate each other. And I'll finish off with some uh, open question in future directions. I think the kind of what a really interesting thing coming out of here is that we actually, by thinking about these algorithms, we're actually getting at some of these different notions of approximations and operator approximations. Can we generalize matrix concentration bound to them? Can we take some of these ideas to nonlinear cases? What's the extent to which these ideas can be taken to nonlinear cases? And this kind of adaptive sampling, do, do they have this kind of dynamic and streaming applications? And I'll finish off with a chart, which is that these are all the properties we want for direct methods. These are all the properties we have for iterative methods. And the claim is that by combining them in the right way in hybrid method, we can probably get the best of both in a provable manner. I'll stop here, and any, I'll take questions. Questions? Um, so if you, um, so just to kind of um, wrap everything back together again, mm -hmm. is, is there, is there, like, just see if I understand, is there, is there, is there at least a class of problems where if you want to solve this, do the backslash command, mm -hmm. you get something that looks like the sorting properties you get? So the currently, how close are we to this? Well, so empirically, how close are we to yeah. getting those kind of numbers? So right now, so. The, the situation with graph Laplacians is that graph Laplacians, it's also a class of problems where in scientific computing, there are packages that work really well for them. So there are things like multigrid methods. So there's one package called lean algebraic multigrid that also does very well. Currently, the clock time for these is something, is something on 10 to the 7 edges. Lean algebraic multigrid is doing about 20 seconds. Uh, the Laplacian.jl or like the combinatorial multigrid stuff by Yanis, these things do about somewhere in that ballpark as well. So we're at a point where in a minute we can get to somewhere between 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 8 at this point. And compared to sorting, where if you're familiar with the performance of sorting, you can sort about a billion numbers. So we're at, off by at least a factor of 10, if not more. But we're also doing significantly better than the quadratic time running bounds that you would infer from just the theoretical bounds for matrix algorithms as well. So um, I'd like to go back to your comments where you're talking about, you know, in between we, we are, uh, I mean, if I understand it correctly, you're saying that if I'm doing some sort of iterative process, I like to go back and examine sort of the structure in terms of graph structure, as long as there is some preservation of graph structure that inform a good hybrid algorithm design. Is that where the sort of key takeaway is in this kind of? Yeah, so in both of these algorithms, what is particularly important <coughs> is that I'm repeatedly applying these randomized tools. And for, for me to be able to apply these randomized tools, I'm using very heavily the structure of my problem. So one thing actually that's very problematic about Gaussian elimination is that for more general systems, it actually tends to get rid of a lot of structure. So generally for things that's not graph Laplacians, what you get is you actually get these very high low rank objects. And low rank objects are bad because the only thing that you can approximate a low rank object with, like a rank one matrix, the only thing that spectrally approximates it is itself. So the quite, so one thing that's actually very interesting here is, is there a way to do this kind of concentration in a way that you don't have to basically do like for all vectors? So this is where I talk about, are there generalizations? By generalization also means some kind of restriction. So things like contractions, maybe that's actually a very powerful thing. So this here, I think there's a lot that one can learn from multigrid algorithms for what are the other ways to keep everything structured. Because, because the way that multigrid really does things is that they, they really, they, they start from the goal of, I want to engineer an algorithm. So they come up with a lot of methods that, where they do keep all the things intermediately structured. 
And, but here, what the, the issue is that we are trying to stay in a provable envelope, so we're using fairly crude ideas coming out of Gauss elimination to do this. The thing is, your previous slide, it seems to have quite a profound result. Oh, where is it? The one where you say this sum matrix is always part of a, a bigger. Where, where was it? Near the end. This one? Uh, oh, he's talking about the, the truss hardness. Oh, the truss hardness result? Near the end. Oh, at the. You say it's always something. <laughs> this one? So it says that trusses are complete for all matrices? Uh, oh, yeah, the NEPSD matrix. That, that, is that a theorem? <laughs> oh, yes, this is a theorem by Rasmus and Pang Zhang, actually, oh, from I'm last year. I'm trying to understand it. But it sounds profound to me. Can you explain it a bit more? <laughs> I'll, I'll be happy to explain this, this a little more. What, it, what this is really saying is, so the problem that, we're, that we were addressing, this actually came out of trying to study what a generalization of graph Laplacians called 2D trusses. What 2D trusses are is that they're really this kind of physical simulation problem where you have points in two dimensions. And then instead of Laplacians, Laplacians are really spring systems. <laughs> 2D trusses, what it is, is that every vertex has a position in two-dimension space. And then your edges are basically this kind of stress and strain measured in the vector sense in two dimensions. So you can think of these things as Laplacians with, instead of one label on vertex, every label, every vertex has two labels. And the statement, so what we originally started off doing is we try to get better algorithms for this. So we try to beat this kind of nested dissection type of algorithms. But then one thing that uh, Rasmus and Pang, what they realized is that if you are allowed any kind of structure, so if you're allowed to build an arbitrary truss, in particular one that does not have good geometric, does not have good geometric embedding, you can actually encode any system of linear equations as one of these two-dimensional trusses. So, so this is actually a very interesting statement in that you can actually go start go classifying all the many classes of structured linear systems. And you can actually show that some of these, so for example, two commodity flow, that they are actually complete in the sense that if you can solve, if you have a fast solver for two commodity flow, you actually have a fast solver for everything. And this actually I mean, led to various degrees of optimism in that there is one degree, which is that we think that you can, a lot of these problems, right, you can start classifying the importance of geometry, the importance of having embeddings in getting faster algorithms. Maybe you can prove that there are problems where if you have geometry, you can do better. If you don't have geometry, you, you, can't, you just can't do anything. The, mo the most extreme sense of optimism is actually that if you set up the right notion of what is it mean, does it mean to be a general PSD matrix, maybe you can actually use some of these graph theoretic techniques to get better algorithms for all PSD matrices. But it, that will probably require a fairly different notion of what does it mean to be, like how to encode the the numerical complexity of one of these problems as well. Okay, let's thank you for joining us.